Welcome, everyone, to our final Distinguished Speaker Series event of the year. This, um, I'm Cindy Passmore. I'm chair of the Graduate Group in Education, and um, that is one of the sponsoring entities for the Speaker Series. The other two are the School of Education and the Dean of the School of Education and the School of Education Alumni Annual Fund. So all of those entities sort of came together to um, invite our distinguished speaker, Ken Zeichner, to talk with us tonight. In order to introduce him properly, we have Steve Athanasis to give us a, a few words about our speaker tonight. Thank you all for coming. Okay, as you can see, uh, th this is a co-sponsored event, although I didn't realize I needed to name a third uh, sponsor for the event. Kenneth Zeichner is the Boeing Professor of Teacher Education in the College of Ed at the University of Washington, Seattle. Some career highlights of Kenneth Zeichner's distinguished career are the following. First, he was a faculty member at UW-Madison from 76 to 09 as a professor of teacher ed and also associate dean of teacher education and international education. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Education, former vice president of Division K, which features teaching and teacher education as part of the American Educational Research Association, or AERA. He's a fellow of AERA. He received the Legacy Award from Division K of AERA, and he also received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education. When I think of Kenneth Zeichner's work, I think of several themes. The first of these is that he's a big picture scholar of teacher ed. He's engaged with teaching and teacher education in countless projects nationally and internationally. He's authored many essays offering macro perspectives, and concrete examples from studies and practice. In 2000, he was on the AERA panel on teacher education, and this was a group that met for seven full day meetings to develop plans, methods, and goals to really try to articulate what, it, what the research is that we have and the research that we need in various strands of teacher education. With Marilyn Cochran Smith of Boston College, Ken co-edited a massive volume over 800 pages called Studying Teacher Education, a really important work in 2005, originally published. I wanted to show you my version that sits on my bookshelf. And I did that for a particular reason. You see here it's got post-its all over the place and you know slices of paper that I've put in there. And that's because this is not just a synthesized collection of a body of research, but it's a useful and usable body of work. I cite it frequently, different chapters throughout. Another key theme in Ken Zeichner's work is teacher education and social justice. This has been a steady focus in his practice and scholarship. He questions and articulates terms, asks what do we mean by social justice, what are different definitions, what's my working definition. He frequently challenges status quo, complicates the nature of research, dignifies teacher knowledge and practice. And in, at one point in 2009, we had a publication of a collection of his essays written from 1991 to 2008 called Teacher Education and the Struggle for Social Justice. Once again, I show you the, the uh, copy that sits on my bookshelf. And here you can see one of the problems with Zeichner's work is that it's just loaded with juicy quotes all over the place. So I'm forever you know, highlighting with a yellow highlighter. I've got these little cryptic plus signs in the margin. I've got that little note that says important critique. And once again, the post-its. In one of the pieces in this collection that I was really impressed with, he was articulating some problems in research on teaching, and I offer you a quote here from one of these. As a university professor, I've seen many graduate student researchers as well as some faculty researchers go into schools primarily to expose the horrors of the educational system. 
What has bothered me most about these studies is not the illumination of the ways in which schools help reproduce social and economic equalities. What is exposed often does exist and needs to be vigorously combated. What is most disturbing about some of these studies is the lack of honesty in the relationships between those who open their lives to academic researchers and the researchers themselves. I've also been troubled, he adds, by the lack of effort to actually do something to try and change the problems that are uncovered. A third theme I want to identify is one that's near and dear to many of us here at UC Davis. We have a teacher inquiry series in the teacher education and MA credential program. And Ken has really been one of the, the leading figures in talking about the nature of teacher research for many years, well ahead of the curve on this. Um, he says about teacher research, in fact, in one of his early essays, teacher research is tolerated as an interesting and less oppressive form of professional development for teachers, but few seriously treat the knowledge that teachers generate through their inquiries as educational knowledge to be analyzed and discussed. But even though he offers critique, as always in Zeichner's work, we see the location of promise. And I think this is really the final theme I want to highlight here that's very important. He locates exceptions to troubling pa patterns. He finds projects with emerging findings that illuminate what we need to know and how we need to move ahead and finds ways of working effectively across divides. This is quite clear in his most recent publication, which just appeared in the Journal of Teacher Education called Democratizing Teacher Ed with Payne and Braco. In this essay, he does what I was just talking about. He says teacher ed needs to make a fundamental shift in whose knowledge and expertise counts in the education of new teachers. And he offers, again, examples from joint work among universities, schools, and communities in a variety of teacher ed programs, highlighting possibilities and, as always, the complexities in pursuing more democratic work in teacher education. I think we're going to hear some of these ideas explored today in Ken's talk. And finally, then, our talk for today is the struggle for the soul of teaching and teacher education, imagining a more democratic future for teacher preparation in the U.S. With that, Kenneth Seitner. Okay. I'm looking for the cursor there. Do you see it? Okay, yeah, go ahead with this. Let me get this. Great. There we go. All right. Good afternoon, good evening. It's great to be back here. It's been a while since I've been to UC Davis. I think I was chatting with some people today who were here back then. It was 2000 that I was last here. I'll try to live up to your promise of leaving you with some optimism. It may, you may doubt that as I proceed through this talk, but uh, in the end, I am optimistic about the future. Um, it's not necessarily a happy story that I'm going to tell today, but I think it's urgent that we pay attention as, a, as teacher educators to the kinds of things I'm going to talk about and that we be able to respond to what I'm talking about. Um, so here we go. This is a critical time for teacher education in the United States. The college and university system of teacher education that has prepared most teachers in the United States for the last 50 years. Um, is being defined as uh, declared a failure by many policymakers, the mainstream media, many university academics, even teacher educators, and, and some K-12 educators. Uh, the Secretary of Ed Education, Arne Duncan, declared that most education schools are doing a mediocre job of preparing teachers. In 2006, Arthur Levine, former president of Teachers College Columbia, called teacher education the Dodge City of Education, unruly and chaotic. The federal government and most of the philanthropic community are currently pouring resources into supporting greater market competition and the entry of new young university providers into the field. Colleges and universities are now facing jurisdictional challenges to our authority to prepare teachers 
in the United States. And we are on a course to dismantle the college and university system of teacher education and replace it with a host of entrepreneurial programs that I believe will worsen rather than ameliorate the opportunity and learning gaps that continue to plague our public schools and that reflect gaps in the larger society. This evening I will share my perspectives on the current landscape and debates in teacher education and offer some ideas about how I think we need to respond to the attacks on our work in preparing teachers. I will reject both the turning back to traditional models of teacher preparation that I think I've been a critic of my whole career, but I'll also reject the efforts now to bring in some of these entrepreneurial programs and to disrupt the system and minimize the role of colleges and universities in teacher preparation, as many policymakers would like to see now. There appear to be three major perspectives on the system of, of where we should go as a, as a country in teacher education. First, there's a position taken by many of our colleagues in ed schools uh, that, uh, and some others, that the criticisms of ed schools in teacher ed are wrong and that we need, what we need is greater investment in college and university teacher education uh, by the government and philanthropy to strengthen our capacity to do teacher education well. I call this the position of the defenders. We're doing a good job, but our good work is not recognized. Defenders do not see the need for significant change in the ways that things are now done, and they, we want, they want more resources to do things better. I some, when I go to AACTE sometimes, and I wasn't able to make it this year, that's sort of the flagship institution for defenders. There's all this celebration of all these wonderful things that are going on, and some of them are, you know, are wonderful, but there are not a lot of people out there that recognize or believe that. Second, there are, the outs there are outsiders to the current system, and even some within, who have argued that education schools have failed and the current system needs to be blown up and that language is used, or disrupted and replaced by an alternative one based on deregulation and market competition. These critics refer to themselves as reformers. Their rapidly expanding entrepreneurial programs often place teacher candidates in schools with very little pre-service preparation and emphasize and uncritically glorify practice and practitioner knowledge while minimizing the role of professional education coursework that is not seen as directly related to daily practice in classrooms. They have often falsely framed the issue as one of choosing between theory and practice in teacher ed, and sometimes proudly proclaim their worth in, in, the, in terms that they have minimized or eliminated theory from their teacher preparation programs. And that somehow, we've been, we're in a situation where that's seen as good, theory versus practice. Um, this kind of thinking that's represented in such programs as uh, Relay Graduate School of Education, Match Teacher Residency, the New Teacher Project, now TNTP, leads to such things as the definition of social foundations of education as non-essential. Those are the words of Kate Walsh, our new expert in teacher education from the National Council of uh, Teaching Quality. Um, and it leads, uh, to a preparation of teachers who can lead, uh, when you separate theory or practice and you focus and glorify practice, it leads to the preparation of teachers who can implement teaching scripts but who have not developed the professional vision, cultural competence, and adaptive expertise they meet, need to meet the changing needs of their students. Uh, and, to, and, and they have not acquired the ability to learn in and from their practice to become better at their teaching uh, for as long as they teach. Finally, there are those inside and outside the system who see the need for substantive transformation of the system as it exists now, but who do not support blowing it up and replacing it with a deregulated market economy. Although they believe that there are aspects of the current system that are working well, transformers do not support maintaining key aspects of the current system. One example of that is the historic disconnect between teacher ed programs at universities and schools and communities. So we pr prepare people, you know, I used to say in Madison, we can, we're gonna prepare you to go anywhere. 
to teach. And I don't believe that anymore. I really believe in the importance of context in uh, preparation. Uh, currently, there are a variety of efforts underway to significantly transform teacher education uh, in colleges and universities, including shifting it more to schools and uh, communities, strengthening the clinical components of programs, Focusing the preparation on the preparation to teach in particular communities and schools. Uh, and focusing the preparation on more on helping candidates actually acquire the ability to enact practices, not just learn about them, to, but to learn how to enact them in the kinds of settings for which they're being prepared uh, to teach. There are also efforts underway to disrupt existing knowledge power hierarchies that uncritically glorify academic or practitioner knowledge and to develop more generally collaborative ownership of teacher education that more strategically accesses the expertise of university faculty, K-12 educators, and members of local communities who are supposed to be served by the public schools that they send their kids to. And currently, it's my belief that both the defenders and the reformers, most of them ignore the idea of community-based knowledge as relevant to teacher preparation. A system of categorization like this inevitably oversimplifies uh, the situation. There's much variation within each of these categories, and there's overlap between them. But it provides a way to begin to think about possible alternatives for the future of teacher education in the United States. Today I will support the third position, one of uh, transformation. Self-designated reformers, heavily funded and supported by incestuous networks of venture philanthropists, think tanks, and nonprofit advocacy groups, and to some extent by the federal government, want to replace the current system while the transformers want change, but they want to stimulate it significant innovation in the system and maintain its public nature. That's a big difference. The transformation position holds that education should be one of our most precious public goods. As Kevin Wellner of University of Colorado has pointed out, although education provides an important private benefit to children and families, it also lies at the center of our societal well-being. He goes on to argue that educational opportunities uh, should never be distributed by market sources because markets exist to create inequalities. They thrive by creating winners and losers. And so I can't, I can't think of a situation where a market-based approach to teacher edu education reform or even school reform has proved that it's superior to what existed before. And so Wellner's quote also alludes to the fact that education is just not a private good or an individual good, it's also a public good, and that a strong uh, public school system is fundamentally important to a democratic society. Um, so historically, there are, many, there are central issues aligning these debates about the best approach to teacher education that stem from different assumptions and convictions about the purpose of public schooling, about the teaching and learning process, and the teacher's role. In these debates, two different visions of the US teaching force are being advocated. On the one hand, some propose building or maintaining a professional teaching force and a system of teacher education that prepares teachers for professional roles and teaching careers. Others believe that it is not possible or desirable to build and maintain a professional teaching force to teach everyone's children and have advocated for preparing teachers of other people's children largely as technicians to implement teaching scripts with which they are provided in the belief that the preparation these teachers will receive and the su su subsequent instruction will lead to rises in standardized test scores. Initial teacher education, in this view, is usually referred to as teacher training and should be very brief. I don't know what's causing the... Uh, should be very brief and take place mainly on the job. Maybe it's heaven speaking to me or something. Uh, there's little expectation that these teachers will have teaching careers, and the system is designed to make it possible for these temporary teachers to be replaced in a few years by other narrowly trained teachers who will also leave the classroom in a few years. For most of the history of teacher education in the USA, 
a variety of pathways has existed inside and outside colleges of education. At one time or another, since the mid-19th century, uh, when formal teacher education began in the U.S., a variety of institutions, such as secondary schools, my wife's high school in Philadelphia, Philadelphia High School for Girls, had a normal school attached to it back in the 1800s, seminaries, academies, normal schools, teacher institutes, community colleges, and so on, have all played important roles in preparing teachers. Throughout our nation's history, most teachers have entered teaching through what might now be referred to as an alternative route, including substantial numbers of teachers who were prepared in school district-based programs. Jim Fraser, a historian at NYU, has noted that by 1914, virtually every city in the United States with a population of 300,000 or more uh, and over 80% of those with over 10,000 maintain their own teacher preparation programs as part of the public school system. So today we have this new idea, quote unquote, of teacher residencies that are based in districts. It's not a new idea. Uh, it's been around for a while. So it was only for a relatively brief period of time, approximately 1960 to 1990, Fraser argues, that colleges and universities held a virtual monopoly on teacher preparation in the United States. And since the 1990s, there have been a tremendous increase in the, develop, in the growth of non-university um, teacher education programs. Um, more and more individuals are now entering the teaching force through non-university routes into teaching, sometimes with little or no preparation before assuming uh, full responsibility for a classroom. Now, despite this tremendous growth since the late 80s, early 90s in non-university programs, most teachers in the United States still enter teaching through college and university uh, programs, one or two year postgraduate programs or four or five year undergraduate programs. It is estimated about two thirds of teachers still enter the profession through colleges and university programs. In some parts of the country though, nearly as many teachers enter the field uh, through non-college and university pathways, and in some cases, the non-university programs prepare more teachers than the university programs. For example, in recent years, two for-profit online teacher education programs, A Plus Texas Teachers and I Teach Texas, have produced more teachers than, many, than any other teacher education programs in the state of Texas. Uh, currently, in the United States, as in many other countries in the world, there are serious gaps, as we all know, in opportunities to learn in school completion rates and academic achievement for di different segments of the population. In addition to the growing inequalities in the access to resources that help individuals live their lives with dignity, such as access to affordable housing, nutritious food, transportation, jobs that pay a living wage, quality health care, and so on, there continues to be a crisis of inequality in the public schools. My colleague Gloria refers to it as the education debt in, in terms of trying to help people see what the cause of it is, what, where the problem is located. Uh, and, uh, and so there, a crisis that denies many children living in poverty a high quality education despite the good work of many talented teachers in the public schools. A number of gaps in educational opportunities have persisted despite everything that's been tried. These include inequalities in achievement as measured by standardized tests in reading and math, in secondary school graduation rates, and increased segregation of students according to race, ethnicity, and social class background. I started in the, in the, in the 60s when the civil rights movement was still going on. The, the segregation today is greater, if, you know, equal if not greater than it was when the civil rights movement started. Uh, inequitable public funding for schools between schools, um, between and within school districts. So it, not only inequality across school districts, as Jonathan Kozel's work documented, but even within school districts with the cuts in public funding and parents in different parts of the district being able to raise different kinds of money. And so it actually is widening the inequalities. And unequal access to advanced courses that provide the gateways to college. And unequal access to a broad and rich curriculum that educates students to understand and to think critically. 
and the, and the disproportionate assignment of students of color and English learners to special education classes with more limited opportunities. These inequities have served to widen the gaps between students who learn to be thinkers and authentic problem solvers and those who are forced to learn out of context and to interact in no, with knowledge in artificial ways. There is also, as in much of the world, an inequitable distribution of fully qualified teachers. Currently, we have a situation in the United States where there are serious gaps, inequities between the kinds of preparation provided for teachers who teach in different communities. Most of the teachers who enter the teaching force through one of the fast track programs in which novices are fully responsible for a classroom with very little preparation. This is in most, almost exclusively in poor communities, urban and rural communities of color and communities of poverty. These early entry teachers who complete most of their preparation serving of te as teachers of record are not found in the public schools uh, for the advocates of these programs uh, and serving the middle and upper classes. Teaching children are many of the advocates of deregulation. There are very few, if any, who send their kids to these schools that are being proclaimed as the future for other people's children. Although the research on the effects of different pathways to teaching is not conclusive, Despite what Mathematica said last week in their new release, teach, you have to actually read these studies. As I, This is one of the areas that I work on. There are a lot of claims that are made about what the research says and, and doesn't say. I just finished a paper, referred to it earlier today, Smoke and Mirrors, Knowledge Ventriloquism, Echo Chambers, and Research on Teacher Education, where we present, my co-author and I, a series of specific cases in which claims about what research on teacher education says and doesn't say is distorted, including in the book that Steve referred to, Hillary and I, who did this paper, Hillary Conklin at DePaul, uh, cite examples from, uh, um, including in the US Congress, where that, the specific chapter that we wrote in that book is distorted and, and misrepresented in congressional hearings as evidence for, uh, supposed evidence that we need to deregulate and privatize uh, teacher education. But there is evidence um, that um, learning loss, there's some evidence of learning loss of pupils who are exposed to underprepared teachers. By the end of, say, the two years of Teach for America, those teachers who in these early entry programs are pretty much caught up to the teachers who come out of the college recommending programs. But during the two years that they're catching up, there's some kids that are losing out on learning. And David Berliner had tried to, has tried to calculate uh, the sort of quantitatively the uh, learning loss um, that's involved. Uh, it's clear though that given the high turnover of teachers in most poverty impacted schools that uh, school staff mainly by early entry teachers have become dependent on a constant supply of uh, young inexperienced teachers who stay for a few years and then leave. The current teacher um, education system, including us in colleges and universities, we're as guilty as the early entry programs, uh, have not helped these communities to develop the capacity to have access to a more experienced teaching staff and to lessen the dependence on inexperienced and underprepared teachers. Given the documented importance of uh, teacher experience in, in determining teacher quality and teaching quality, this is a serious problem for many uh, communities of affected by poverty. Um, okay, now I'm going to jump to, um, there have been two major responses of the federal government and private foundations to these enduring problems of teacher education. Um, first response has involved efforts to build an effective system of teacher ed in colleges and universities. Uh, since the mid-1960s, the federal government has invested in strengthening the college and university system of teacher education through competitive grants that were administered in Washington or through the states. Programs like the current Teacher Quality Partnership Grant that pro pro supports partnerships between universities and schools and teacher education are exam is an example of how the federal government has attempted historically to improve the quality of teacher education by injecting targeted resources into ed schools to promote innovation. Additionally, several private foundations, notably the Carnegie Corporation and the Ford Foundation, have historically invested substantial amounts of money to improve the quality of teacher education for schools highly impacted by poverty. I myself am a graduate of um, um, 
MAT program uh, that was funded by the Ford Foundation, uh, focusing on urban uh, teaching um, some time ago. Um, so these foundations, the, the, the most recent example of the foundation efforts to improve teacher education is over $100 million Teachers for a New Era project that was supposed to uh, transform teacher preparation in 11 institutions, including the University of Washington, and that through these 11 institutions, the whole field of teacher education would be transformed. Sort of what I remember, I started out in the National Teacher Corps um, as a teacher educator, and that was supposed to transform teacher education and education schools and K-12 schools, and it, it didn't work for a variety of reasons. But um, the TNE is the most recent example of, of, of this project, and, and I mentioned earlier today that I interviewed the director of that project uh, for some research I was doing, and I said, well, what can you say about the impact of the $100 million? And it was sort of like there was an article in the New Yorker this year about the impact of Mark Zickelberg's uh, $100 million in the Newark schools, and the answer is not much. And so um, um, for what I'm going to describe now, I think there's some justification to the idea that ed schools have been resistant to change. And the response now of the philanthropic community has been almost unanimously, there are some exceptions to this, to dismantle colleges and universities' role in teacher education, in part because of the widespread uh, perception that uh, the teacher ed institutions, ed schools, have been unwilling to change. There's been a shift away from investing in the improvement of the system uh, that is dominated by colleges and universities toward breaking up the system to replace it with greater market competition. Arthur Levine, who did this study that's continually used, that's another thing in this smoke and mirrors paper, how that study that supposedly says that we failed is used by different people and how other studies are um, uh, ignored and how certain findings out of his study are always put out there, but other findings and the nuance and complexity in his report are ignored. But he says, uh, the private sector sees teacher education and professional development as a low cost, high volume field with the potential for significant profit. Higher education is viewed in high in price, low in technology use, inefficient and weak in leadership. These perceived weaknesses make it a superb investment prospect. Now, consistent with the current fervor in the national media to criticize education schools as obstacles to education reform uh, and define teacher education programs as barriers to entry to teaching, that's what we, we serve as barriers to uh, entry, both the Bush and Obama administrations and several influential private foundations, including the one in my hometown that one of my sons works for, and he, he's, his job is to eradicate polio or to help do that, so he's not in education. Um, and venture capital organizations that are very influential in this process have promoted the deregulation of teacher education and the growth of these, these sort of new players in the field. Currently, college and university teacher ed is not seen as worthy of significant investment by the federal government or most foundations who are pouring millions of dollars into supporting alternatives to university pathways to teaching that lessen our role. Major conferences in the national media have been flooded with speeches that wonder if a college and university system of teacher education is even a good idea. I remember in 2004 going to a keynote speech by Tom Pizant, who was superintendent of Boston schools at the time. It was entitled, Should, should Schools of Education Be Involved in Teacher Preparation? And, it, and he, he was scolding the audience for um, all those, all the universities in the Boston area, you're not sending me teachers who uh, uh, are able to succeed and stay, and if you don't get your act together, I'm going to start my own program. And guess what? He did, the Boston Teacher Residency. Um, the lack of investment in colleges and universities has had many serious consequences for university uh, teacher ed. So we have... Uh, fewer resources and has actually uh, uh, deepened the inability of ed schools to innovate in places where they're most in need of reform. The local media all over the country has taken up in an uncritical way the narrative, narrative of derision 
that I call it, about the alleged failure of ed schools and teacher education that's being promoted like groups by groups like the New Schools Venture Fund, which I hope you've heard of by now. If not, we can talk about it later. The Gates Foundation, Democrats for Education Reform, um, and other groups which are shaping the teacher education policy agenda in Congress right now. For example, in 2011, the Seattle Times published a lead editorial re refocusing the teacher quality debate and praised the main element in Duncan's uh, plan for education accountability, uh, value-added scores. What's actually being implemented now is, is rolling in. It started in 2011. Seattle Times praised this and then reprinted a comment made by uh, Harvard teacher educator Kay Merseth that had been in some forum an online discussion about something at, that uh, they print, where she essentially says there are only 100 good teacher ed programs in the United States and the rest should be shut down tomorrow. And the implication, you know, here's a Harvard professor saying the field has failed and most of the programs need to shut down. And the way this editorial was written, they were essentially endorsing that um, because a Harvard professor said it. You know, that kind of thing is very common. And that particular quote, there's an excerpt here, has been reprinted all around the country. Um, so um, along with the lack of investment by the federal government and foundations in the increased regulation of colleges and universities by the uh, education department and states, which f further undermines our ability to innovate, many states have substantially reduced their level of financial support uh, to public universities, where again, most of the nation's teachers continue to be educated. When I arrived in Seattle 2009, between 2009 and 2012, I came into the, I was also director of teacher education during that time. The state of Washington reduced its financial support to the University of Washington by 50%. So here we're in a situation, the public funds are going away, tuition is going up, Staff are being laid off. Foundations are turning away from ed schools. The government, you know, just gave $50 million to Teach for America for its, in an I-3 competition that led them coming to places like Seattle and Sacramento and other places because they promised to expand by 80% uh, through this money that the government was giving them. Um, and so it's a, it's a difficult situation. And these new punitive forms of accountability that have been brought into teacher education, even though they've been questioned by leading experts in assessment. And the most controversial, of course, is the VAM, or the value added, that's a central feature of the secretary's blueprint for teacher education, as he called it, to evaluate and rank teacher ed programs and universities to a large extent based on the standardized test scores of their pupils uh, taught by their graduates. This is equivalent to medical schools, um, uh, evaluating medical schools according to how many patients are cured by doctors who graduated from different medical schools. Or at another level, holding business schools accountable for the state of the US economy, or engineering schools accountable for the problems of infrastructure such as collapsing bridges. All of the cautions that have been raised by assessment experts about using student test scores to evaluate teacher quality and the additional problems that are raised by trying to connect this back to uh, teacher preparation programs have been ignored by policymakers. And so there was a book that came out. Dana Goldstein wrote a book. I don't know how many read it, Teacher Wars. It's actually an excellent book written about the history of teaching in the United States. And she says about this uh, accountability that's moving into teacher ed, she says, even with three years of data, one in four teachers will be misclassified. It is difficult, if not impossible, to compute an accurate value-added score for teachers who work in teams um, within a single classroom, or for two-thirds of the teachers who teach in grades or classes not subject to standardized tests. So Louisiana and Tennessee, two of the states that have already attempted to link student performance back to teacher ed programs, and have also among the worst public school systems in the country in terms of performance resources going into it, have suddenly become exemplars for reforming teacher education in the United States. There are a number of more um, reasonable ways, in my view, to bring in, to strengthen accountability in teacher education. And I support that general goal. 
uh, higher quality observation-based assessments. We invest a lot of money at every ed school in sending coaches or supervisors out to observe, and the quality is highly variable. And we know from the MET study that the Gates Foundation funded and other studies that we could do a really good job if we invested in improving the quality of that. I'm, I'm in support of the idea and theory of a high quality performance assessment. Um, seems a reasonable goal. Or strengthening accreditation, although I'm not necessarily supportive of the strength, so-called strengthening that's been going on in the last few years. But the idea that a profession monitors the quality its own quality is, is reasonable, uh, rather than coming in with these uh, punitive uh, value uh, added and other external accountability mandates. Um, and so we have to admit that the systems we have, both the professional accountability, the voluntary national accreditation, and the bureaucratic accountability out of state departments, has not really worked that well. There are programs out there, both university and non-university, that are not very good. There's a, there's a lot of variable quality. Um, now, support for non-university providers of teacher education continues to increase. And both nonprofit and for-profit providers are opening up many new programs across the country. The dominant view among policymakers and the public is that the U.S. needs to bring more of these programs in and to reduce our role. Um, and that we need to provide shorter, more practical, uh, programs uh, and that uh, it's argued that bringing in a wider range of expertise and competition into the preparation of teachers will promote innovation and raise the overall quality of programs. But despite the noble proclamation, proclamations of intent, there's a lot of money to be made in the teacher education market uh, if it's transformed into primarily uh, competitive market economy. Some of the new programs, like A-plus a Texas teachers, advertise fast, affordable, and easy access to the teaching profession. This one actually had a group on where you could sign up for um, <laughs> the introductory course at a bargain rate for three days only. Um, while other non-university programs provide more substantive preparation for teaching. One of the more recent aspects of this movement to privatize what has largely been a public teacher education system is to open charter teacher education programs like the Relay Graduate School of Education that began in New York and is spreading around the country now uh, to prepare teachers for charter schools. In return, what they claim are higher standards. Uh, in return, what they, they, they want higher standards. Their graduates have to raise test scores a certain amount, and they want to be exempted from all the new accountability uh, mechanisms that, that are coming in to affect colleges and universities. A bipartisan bill uh, it now sits in the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind. Uh, even my Senator Patty Murray, who's the leading Democrat on the Senate Education and Labor Committee, is in support of it. That would essentially give money to states to create these charter teacher ed programs. Um, and the idea is that it would create greater market share for our uh, non-university programs to come in to compete with us and that they would not be subject to the same accountability mechanisms that are now rolling in to affect us. Not surprisingly, the New Schools Venture Fund, a venture capital organization that is hugely responsible for uh, what's happened in K-12 education and was also doing work in um, teacher education. They're the initial funders of Relay. They've given to TFA. The Urban Teacher Center is one of their um, startups that they then, then want to scale up has invested money in actually promoting this bill. And I actually was totally unaware of it, but my dean was, um, he was a fan of the New School Venture Fund, my former dean. Uh, and so he told me about, he received a letter from them asking him to endorse this bill. And I saw it and I said, what, what is this group? And then I, I spent a year and a half, almost two years researching this group. And I was telling people earlier I needed therapy after a year and a half of totally immersing myself in the uh, literature on uh, philanthropy and education or educational entrepreneurship. And I published a paper in Teachers College Record that went up in May on the website that looks at the role of the New Schools Venture Fund along with Teach for America and other groups in promoting this bill 
that was actually written by uh, people from the New School's vent. They took this bill to Congress and found uh, Bennett from, uh, he was the original person they went to, and it's, uh, it was uh, uh, sitting there because of the reauthorization, but, um, and it's buried deep. If you read the, I don't know how many thousands of pages of the draft, No Child Left Behind, it's deep in there and nobody's gonna notice it. Just like the uh, bill that they put through that, um, overturned the Ninth Circuit Court in California that said that it's not all right to call people who haven't completed their preparation highly qualified teachers. That was a court case that parents in California won. So in the general spending bill, twice now, the government has put in um, buried deep to keep the government operating this thing that is an exception to that. So that we can still call Teach for America teachers and those kinds of teachers highly qualified legally which again, the Ninth Circuit Court ruled was unjust and, and, and allowed. So they're getting around these things and they're being helped by these uh, organizations. Um, Rick Hess of uh, the American Enterprise Institute, their head education guy, has articulated a view that's shared by many others when he proposed decoupling the preparation of teachers from institutions of higher education rather than reinvesting in these programs. Hess and many others want to create a system where preparation is controlled by local school districts. They'll tolerate universities being around to some extent, but only doing the things that others want us to do. Um, and so, and we're moving in this um, direction. Currently, there are two general approaches to teacher ed that I sort of alluded to despite all the specific program variations. There are college recommending programs where um, somebody completes all their preparation before becoming a teacher of record, record. And on the other hand, the early entry or direct entry programs, as they're called in Britain, uh, where much of the teacher's initial education is completed by individuals while they're fully responsible for classrooms. The encouragement the encouragement to university hegemony over teacher education is not necessarily a bad thing. All right? There's wide range in quality in both early entry programs and college and university programs. Uh, and the introduction of different models can potentially stimulate innovation to help improve all types of teacher preparation. Despite the improvements that have made, been made in recent years in college and university-based programs, there's clearly a need for further and significant change. It's also the case that there are progressive elements in the critique of ed school teacher preparation that address the failure of our programs overall in preparing enough teachers who te choose to teach in, are successful in, and stay in schools serving students in poverty. Um, now, despite the potential to make um, a lot of money through the disruption and recreation of the current teacher education system and the sometimes blatant arrogance of some of the, um, those who uh, uh, talk about the alleged superiority of these entrepreneurial programs um, coming in, I do not question the motives of those who seek to dismantle the system that we have and replace it with a deregulated market. Self-serving behavior, greed, and a lack of concern for the common good can be found in all the various um, uh, camps of teacher education reform, including in ed schools to some extent. And so can a genuine concern for the common good. So I think it's really important that I make the point that I'm not trying to demonize the folks who are trying to take our place. Uh, I think in many cases the intentions are um, um, good ones. Uh, but I think they're misguided. Uh, and I think that's an, a distinction that I'm, I'm not trying to criticize the motives of people. It's important to note that many of these early entry alternatives that currently exist are closely linked with the mostly technical view of the role of teachers and with efforts to erode teachers' economy and collegial authority. Contrary to the many recommendations internationally to recognize teaching as complex and demanding intellectual work, uh, involving specialized knowledge and skill, the focus in some of these new programs is on preparing teachers to serve primarily as educational clerks who implement scripted teaching strategies and curriculum instead of preparing teachers as uh, thoughtful professionals who in addition to their technical competence also have acquired the ability to adapt their practice, to exercise discretion and judgment in their work, 
and to adjust their teaching to meet their individual needs of their students. And I used the example earlier today, the curriculum at Relay Graduate School of Education. That's one of the um, uh, foci in this new paper that I finished. The curriculum essentially consists of mastering Doug LaMalle's 49 strategies and a course on grit. Uh, if there's anybody here from Relay, I'd be happy to discuss it with you. And so my argument is that not, those things are not unimportant. In our secondary program, there was a professor who covered some of Lamov's, Lamov's strategies. But if that's all they're getting, I think it leads to a very narrow preparation. Um, and there's some problems here. The difference between these two views is that the teacher as a professional goes beyond providing teachers with teaching and management skills and also seeks to ensure that teachers have extensive knowledge about the social and political context in which they work, including the funds of knowledge in the communities where their students live, and that many of the elements connected to teaching they have access to, such as uh, theories about assessment, learning, development, theories of how languages are acquired, a professional preparation for teachers also seeks to help teachers learn how to exercise their judgment and to continue to learn over time. Both of those perspectives assume deep content uh, knowledge. Um, the role of alternative pathways into teaching has long been part of teacher education, as I said, and research on different models supports the need for different pathways to provide access to teaching for individuals at different stages of, of their lives and in different life circumstances. Research has begun to a, provide a clear understanding of the characteristics of effective programs that prepare teachers to promote student learning in the most economically challenged urban and rural areas of the country. And there's a body of work, uh, Linda Darman, Darling Hammond's book, Powerful Teacher Education, articulates a number of these principles that we, uh, we studied seven exemplary programs around the country. I studied Alverno in Milwaukee and uh, looked across these programs. And I, when I say successful, it's not just uh, they had a lot of publications. We talked to superintendents about who do you like to hire? And in Wisconsin, it was Alverno College, not University of Wisconsin, Madison, um, to my uh, sadness. Um, um, and so we do know some things. But and when we judge the success of teaching and teacher ed programs, we, knew, we need to move beyond the current focus on whose graduates can raise standardized test scores the most and broaden the analysis to include an analysis of costs and benefits that also include attention to what are the costs associated with raising test scores. Earlier, I referred to an article in Ed Researcher last year by Joan Goodman that talks about no excuses charter schools in Philadelphia where she makes the argument that kids' identities are being um, destroyed and their self, sense of self-worth through the high control mechanisms where they're punished for things that aren't bad but may lead to bad things. Um, and, and so what are the costs of raising test scores? Uh, what about teacher retention and access to experienced teachers in communities? Are we helping with that? Uh, the debate about success in teacher ed has been framed by reformers only on the issue of raising test scores and has ignored other important aspects, including the widely documented narrowing of curriculum in schools attended by children in poverty that have suffered the most under the No Child Left Behind regime. Uh, and so the, 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 what we have is earlier, second class schools or schools in quote where kids basically prepare for tests and take tests, while in other public schools, uh, kids have social studies and science and art and music and so on. And so we're, 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 there's some negative effects. We have to look more broadly than just who can raise test scores, but look more uh, fully at a number of criteria. Um, these claims about the superiority of programs like Relay uh, that have been funded by venture philanthropy their superiority over us in universities are based on the exception of the claim um, only of the raising of standardized test scores. Um, the educational entrepreneurs who are brought, funded by the uh, venture philanthropists to come in and start up these programs are referred to in glowing tones in the literature. Rick Hess, for example, has referred to the uh, educational entrepreneurs in teacher education as pioneers, visionary thinkers, the engines of progress, imaginative, creative, and talented. And these assertions are taken at face value in calls to deregulate and push toward marketization of teacher education. 
the absence of research demonstrating the superiority of these programs, like Relay, Math Teacher Residency, the Urban Teaching Center, and even by their own narrow standard of raising test scores, there isn't the evidence that exists, raises serious questions about the warrant for these claims. Saying over and over again that these programs are innovative, groundbreaking, and bold does not make it true. That's the idea of echo chamber. Um, but again, even if they produce study, if Relay tomorrow produces a set of studies that show that their graduates raise test scores and some independent research that's been vetted by somebody uh, some, and done by somebody other than Mathematica, um, then I'd still be concerned because if we're only talking about raising test scores, there are parents who want many more things for their kids in school and they'd be concerned about the kinds of things that Joan uh, Goodman um, raises in her article um, about uh, test scores. Further concerns are raised about what's happening now when we read statements like the following in the literature on education entrepreneurship. And here's one from Rick Hess, uh, where he said, the expectation is not that the typical venture will improve upon the status quo. Some ideas won't pan out and many will fail. Both philanthropists and the broader public must accept that it is okay for investments to fail. So, as lo so long as the failure is in pursuit of results-oriented solutions. We must not forget that these entrepreneurial solutions for the ills of teacher education have direct consequences exclusively for children living in poverty and not for the children of the entrepreneurs and the middle and upper middle classes. This situation has negative consequences for the society as well, given the consequences of creating a stripped down and inferior set of schools for many students living in poverty. And as I said earlier, very few of these entrepreneurs and African cities programs send their own children and grandchildren to these schools that they refer to as uh, tremendously innovative. Schools staffed by teachers who enter teaching uh, and complete most of their preparation on the job. I do not think it's acceptable to use children who can least afford the experience of a diminished educational opportunities for uh, access to rich learning experiences as guinea pigs for the entrepreneurial revolution in teacher education. This is not a high tech startup. We're talking about children, people's children and grandchildren. And so I think this is uh, quite disturbing um, to me. And so we have this selective use of research. We have the echo chamber repeating these things over uh, and over again. There are several problems with the lack of investment in, in minimizing the role of ed schools and teacher preparation while pouring all these resources into other alternatives. Um, we do most of the preparation. We have 3.6 million teachers. I can't imagine a system of teacher preparation in the United States that um, could provide 3.6 million teachers that doesn't rely in, an, in a significant way on colleges and universities. Expanding Teach for America and programs like it, they, they prepare, when you look at the amount of money that's been given to them, hundreds of millions of dollars, and the percentage of the U.S. teaching force that they've actually prepared. This is not the solution to anything. Uh, and there are alternatives that exist to sending outsiders into communities to um, uh, save them, uh, which include actually helping people who live in these communities become classroom teachers, and they want to stay there. And you begin to build the capacity um, to um, um, have ex access to experienced teachers. Um, no country in the world today, as I said earlier, that has been successful in international comparisons of student achievement has achieved this success by relying heavily on a market-based economy in teacher education. Despite the uh, success of some charter schools, the overall poor track record of privatization and the spread of charter schools at the K-12 level, I think that's the consensus, that some of them are good, but overall they haven't improved things, uh, does not bode well for what's now happening to teacher education in the United States. We've moved down that direction and I predict we'll be in the same condition um, of not uh, necessarily improving things. 
Underlying much of the movement to privatize public schooling and teacher ed is a belief that the major cause of our problems um, of inequities in schooling is bad teachers and bad teacher ed programs. I mentioned earlier that uh, Arne Duncan has asserted that most of our programs are mediocre. Kate Walsh goes around talking about us as an industry of mediocrity. That was actually the title of uh, a New York Times op-ed recently within the past few months, Industry of Mediocrity. That's what we've been labeled. Rod Page, Secretary of under Education under Bush at one point, and uh, people like John Chubb and other reformers have uh, argued that participation in teacher education be voluntary, that the state licensing of teachers be eliminated, and that the market should be allowed to operate, that schools should hire whoever they want and whether they want, if they want preparation, it should be up to them, and that people should just be allowed to go in. There's an ALEC bill, American Legislative Exchange Council, that promotes that, and that's why it appears that that bill to try to authorize that appears simultaneously in state after state. It just popped up in Wisconsin, where um, our potential future president, Scott Walker, brought that in. So anybody um, uh, with a bachelor's degree can go in and teach. That's the, the bill. I don't know if it's been finalized, but that's come up. And so ALEC is a key player in, in this mechanism of trying to shift teacher education. Um, there's the mistaken belief that if we could only fire the bad teachers and close the bad teacher education programs um, and turn um, public schooling and teacher ed over to market competition, everything will be fine. This narrative ignores the overwhelming evidence that links inequities in schooling to the broader society, to equities in the broader society, um, and uh, places the, the blame in the wrong place. And that's one of the reasons that Gloria um, had ar has argued for this shift from achievement gaps to education depth to, to sort of point toward the structural inequalities. That rather than the problem being in the, the students, their parents, and, and the communities, or the teachers. Uh, despite a need to improve teacher education, these programs are about as responsible, our programs, for the crisis of inequality in public education as business schools are for the collapse of the U.S. economy in 2007 and, and for the resultant economy. So we're, we're holding ed schools responsible for something that we don't hold other professional schools to. I once asked Lee Shulman um, about, can you think of another example of, a, and he was doing this study of, pro of professions when he was head of the Carnegie Foundation, another example of accountability in a professional school that holds uh, the preparation institutions responsible for outcomes, you know, three years out, four years, and he couldn't think of one. And so education is being uh, singled out, and, and why? Because it's, it's part of this broader effort. Um, to privatize education and provide, uh, there's a lot of, there's a growing inequality in the country right now, and there's a lot of money that some people have that they need to invest. And there is this opportunity, uh, I think Rupert Murdoch once said, I forget the, how many billions of dollars that are potentially available in the education market, uh, the education industry, and so there's a lot of money that is going from people who have accumulated this wealth during this period of growing inequality into these ventures, new school venture fund. That's what they do. They handle money from venture capitalists who, who give them money and they invest it and then they see they look for a scaling up. That's why Relay is spreading around the country now, even without the Great Act. Uh, they're all over the place. Houston, Chicago, New Orleans. They're still in Newark and New York. About to open in Memphis, Philadelphia. Um, you know, I sometimes say to graduate students that when you finish, you, if you don't finish soon, the only choice you'll have is which relay campus that you're going to take a job in. Um, it's really moving very rapidly, um, and I think it's really serious. If you go to AACTE, they now have, you know, the music and the flashing lights, and it's all this celebration, and it, it really masks a, a very um, uh, alarming situation where we're, literally seeking to destroy a system of teacher education in, a, in, a, in a, what used to be a very strong public system of higher education. We're also destroying higher education in a lot of ways um, that um, by reducing the state support 
and the commitment of the public that changed the nature of the, the culture at these instances, becoming more entrepreneurial and um, things like larger class sizes are seen as good doctoral education is too expensive. We can't expand that too much because what we need is big undergraduate classes to bring in money. And these are realities now. It's one of the reasons that every time somebody calls me about being a dean, I say thank you, but no thank you. Um, I, don't, I personally don't want to operate, so I'm, you know, it's a difficult situation for deans to work in, given what's happened to public universities. Now, despite the um, indisputable problems that have existed in the university teacher ed in the United States that have been pointed out not only by people on the outside, by, by people on the inside themselves, there are many improvements that have been made in programs over time and the existence of a number of exemplary programs. And there's this growing movement to respond to some of the enduring problems, to move teacher education more into schools and communities. Um, the kinds of setting, to contextualize it. Not only methods courses, but uh, some places, including Washington, we have social foundations courses that are referred to as place-based, where a lot of the issues that you discuss in a school and society class are localized to, to the particular communities that the teachers are um, in when they're taking the class. Um, and to strengthen the clinical component, which continues to be a problem. James Conant said in 1963 that this was sort of a key area we need to invest in this, that cooperating teachers are, are working full time and they receive minimal compensation and we need to change that. And um, it's not really been addressed, but there's movement to try to transform it and, and say that this is important and we need to take it seriously and put the resources into it. Um, there are growing examples of new, more connected school and university uh, programs uh, where responsibility is shared across schools, universities, and communities. That is, the residency offers the potential, that residency model, for that kind of uh, collective ownership of the programs. And I referred earlier today, some people were there, to the Seattle Teacher Residency where um, there is this collective ownership with the university, the school district, community partners, and the teachers union own the program collectively. And it's housed in a neutral location outside of both the university and the school. Um, and the idea is to, to utilize both the strengths of uh, the universities, the schools, and the communities uh, rather than any one partner owning it. So programs like the Boston Teacher Residency, which is, you know, Pizant says, we're going to start our own program. And he has a program. It's based in the schools. There's a university that stamps the degrees, but they don't decide the curriculum. They don't hire the instructors. They stamp the degrees, UMass Boston. And so that's not really the kind of program that I think is the future. I think the kind of future for teacher education is one where we stay involved in teacher ed, because um, I think it's important we do have something to offer. We've just been unable to articulate it to people what we have to offer and convince them that it's worthwhile for us to be here. The difference between this sort of narrow preparation and this broad professional preparation. You know, why do we need that? What do we have to offer? Um, we've, we've done a poor job of articulating that. Um, and so I think we're, in a sense, responsible for some of the things that have happened for us. This is uh, one photo from um, one of the events. Uh, this is a, a photo from uh, some of the community work. That, so this is a particular event on the school to prison pipeline where we had a panel of people talking to our three teacher ed programs. And, and so this African-American woman is a local principal of an elementary school. And there's community members. And there's teachers there and teacher candidates. And so it's a learning experience where everybody comes together as learners and everybody's contributing something that they know, including positioning teacher candidates as experts in, on certain things. There was a session that one of the grad students who works with me on the community work that I do held the other day where teacher candidates in the current cohort were talking about some of the experiences they did in family visits with the community and talking to probably the majority of the cohort this year who hadn't had that experience. And so they said it was like the first time that they had been positioned as knowing something in the program. And so there's this tendency to um, have a top-down sort of, you know, the university professors and instructors are the experts, and we transfer the knowledge, and then they go out and apply it in schools. And so this is a, 
different kind of model that's concerned from the very beginning with the contextualizing and situating of what it is we teach them. So we have methods courses that are offered in schools where faculty teach side by side with classroom teachers in elementary school classrooms, for example, where they're demonstrating certain quote unquote core practices, ambitious practices. And then the, the students, the candidates go through a series of rehearsing and planning together and enacting and the teacher educators, their extra resources in these courses. And the teacher educators see what they're able to do and not do. They coach them in ways that they couldn't when they were teaching on campus. And the students would come back and talk about their placements, but the professors really didn't know. They couldn't understand what was going on. Um, and so they really like being there, even though they have to like lug all their stuff out to these schools and deal with the traffic on I-5. And, um, but they really think that it's really powerful. Um, and so um, teachers and professors working together, community members, mentoring teacher candidates, which is something that we're, it's my main focus right now in my work in teacher ed. And so this sort of hybrid um, model, I think, is the future. And so this one paper that was referred to by Steve uh, has a little bit about it. And I think um, uh, this next paper, we're going to do a presentation at AERA on the community work specifically. That is, more of it's going to come out. So in conclusion, currently we have a situation in the United States where there's serious inequities between the kinds of teacher education that's provided for teachers who work in different communities. And I've said a number of times, most teachers who enter the teaching force through one of the fast track or early entry programs um, teach in schools with children living in poverty, many of them children of color. Um, addressing serious inequities in educational opportunities and outcomes that continue to plague our schools will require significant re investment in redesigning in fundamental ways the uh, current system of teacher ed. So that does become more clinically based, focus more in the specific context with which we're preparing teachers. It must more effectively integrate college and university expertise with expertise in schools and communities and prepare, and this is the only way we're going to prepare the professional teachers that everyone's children deserve. There's no reason to believe from the poor performance of deregulation of markets and other sectors of the society, I haven't even talked about that today, you know, what do we know about markets and deregulation and all the other public sphere um, industries that have been deregulized and privatized? Um, um, there's not a lot of strong evidence that that's an approach that's going to improve teacher education. Continuing on this path, in my view, will only serve to, to widen inequalities in public education that now exist between different segments of the population. And the thing about this is, um, it's not just an academic exercise. This is really um, something, we're really losing control of the system. We don't have many friends. When somebody, somebody in Washington told me that Kate Walsh of the NCTQ is one of our best allies. Um, and that sort of, if you know the work of NCTQ and you know, we're the industry of mediocrity, that sort of conveys the seriousness of the situation when somebody who's trying to um, profit by you know, just producing these magazine ratings of teacher ed programs and uh, enhancing the legitimacy of her organization um, as um, experts in teacher education is one of our best friends. We are in real serious trouble. And, I, and so I think we need to pay attention to what's going on. We need to know about the GREAT Act. Uh, we need to, and hopefully you did, comment on the rules, and we need to be educating our legislators about what is actually going on. I, you know, I've been in touch with uh, uh, Jim McDermott, my congressperson, uh, Democrat, with Patty Murray's office, uh, trying to have them, to get them to pay attention to these things um, that are going on, such as the highly qualified teacher uh, deception, I call it, because essentially, if they had uh, stuck with the ruling of the California court, uh, all those programs would not have had to go away. It's just that parents would know that their children are being taught by people who have not completed their preparation, and they didn't want that to happen. Um, and so, and, and, and these things get, again, buried in the legislation, and people don't pay attention to them. They're concerned. They want to get something in for their district. 
or their constituency, and so they're not paying. And so very few people are actually aware that this so-called GRADE Act is sitting there buried in um, NCLB reauthorization. And when that goes through, if it goes through, that goes along with it. And then suddenly we'll be seeing the multiplication of these um, charter um, teacher, charter serving teacher education programs um, to prepare these teachers. And Doug Lamov will, you know, be even more um, richer, be even richer than he is now. And, and, and this kind of stuff is actually traveling around the world as well. He's in, he was in Chile recently um, marketing um, 49 strategies to become a champion teacher. And I think we really have to fight for um, everyone's child to have access to a high quality and genuine education where they get to interact with knowledge in real ways that recognizes and builds on uh, what they bring from their home situation. So I urge you to uh, pay attention to this. You know, go look up the New Schools Venture Fund after this and, uh, and, and try to educate people about it. And, and then also, as I said earlier, help to articulate what it is that we do beyond AERA to a broader audience, particularly to policymakers, to the media, um, to try to explain, um, to counter the sort of things that they're putting out there um, because of a lot of pressures on them and their declining budgets as well. Uh, and I don't think the journalists are necessarily bad people, but they're in a situation where they're competing with blogs and all sorts of things, and they just are fed this stuff. In fact, there's a, it was an article in Atlantic called The Story Behind the Story that talks about the nomination of uh, Justice Sotomayor and how on these TV news shows, the same story, I forget the specifics of it, started appearing one network after another. And there were these two guys that dug out this information. And then they, 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 the stuff is just fed into the news organizations. And now it's stuff about ed schools. Ed schools have failed. Relay and programs like it are great and wonderful. And they just reproduce it. And we're in a situation where um, it's hard for us to persuade people that what we do matters. And I think it does matter. So um, hang in there. Thank you. So I think we have a little time, right? Yeah. Um, so let's just pretend there's um, a superintendent in the area who's getting pressure from a, a certain mayor to consider TFA. Um, coincidentally, the mayor's wife happens to be a TFA <laughs> core, former core member. Um, and the superintendent is feeling the pressure and asking the questions about um, the diversity of the pool of teachers that they can provide where we're constantly looking at our programs on how we can recruit to improve the diversity of our candidates here. Um, can you point me in, in the direction of any research that will help illuminate okay, that so TFA first, does or doesn't have better representation? So first of all, the issue of performance. And I'm saying these studies continue to come out. That we all know, and I put a quote in the paper from the Teach TFA website, that overall TFA teachers are superior to other teachers generally and acknowledges that there's some different, fi but that's not true. You have, to, you have to actually look at the studies and, and look at the National Research Council, National Academy of Education, and AERA did analyses of the body of research, and it, it, you can't tell much from the research. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, the research shows that the university teacher ed is not important. That's what some people conclude from the, the, the bad studies that have been done. Uh, there's a lot of problems methodologically. Um, and so I think we need to counter the idea that Teach for America teachers are better. I think we need to broaden. Let's look at retention. Let's look at teacher experience. You know, there's some research on the longevity of TFA teachers in these districts, and, and, it's, and as, uh, it's not very high. So it's not, so if we bring in more teachers of color, and I don't know that that's necessarily the case, that they do overall. I think they're working on that, and there's a project to focus on African American males in particular. They're trying to rebrand themselves, in, in my view. Um, 
So if they come in for two years or three years and then they leave, what, you know, what are the effects on these communities? You know, we're, we're focusing on teacher diversity in Seattle with the residency, and we build a program where people have to commit to five years minimum to get in the program, and we had uh, close to 60% teachers of color in the first cohort, compared to about 39 or 40 in our regular TEP programs. And so I think there are other ways to get in more teachers of color, which I think is a really important issue for a variety of reasons, that's going to actually lead to teachers who stay there. And so we need, you know, the problem is it's complicated. And somebody mentioned earlier today, it's hard to convey stories with nuance and complications to the media. They tend, and I've been hurt a number of times where I say something and, in fact, there was this thing about deans for impact, and I had all these people contact me because I was quoted in the article, saying, why did you not go after these people? And, you know, and it was like, I did, ex I, my interview with the reporter, I got into a lot of things, but that didn't get in there. The, the, the guy put in, Stephen Salchuk, who's like assistant editor, only put in what he wanted to put in. And so it's a real problem through the media to get the nuance and complexity out. But I think there are ways, I, I think the idea of retention, there's a lot of evidence, hard evidence that um, teacher churn disrupts student learning, that experienced teachers matter. And if you don't have access to them in a community, that's not good. And so Teach for, uh, teach for America is not gonna solve that. And uh, so I think, um, and there's been some efforts. Uh, Julian, um, the guy at Sacramento now, he's, he has a blog where he's done these analyses of the Teach for America research and put stuff out there. And, uh, but they still, they have so much money and they spend so much on marketing and branding and it's hard to compete with that. We don't have that kind of media capacity uh, to, to get the same level of visibility. And then they, um, it's deceptive. I was on a panel at ARA last year. It was Linda Darling Hammond and I, and a vice president from Teach for America, and Tim Knowles from the University of Chicago, who um, he's one of the ones I had a quote from him Teacher Ed has failed. Um, and so, but the teach, I got up and said something. I, I got excited and I couldn't control myself, so I started ranting against parachuting teachers into communities to save them. And I thought it was offensive, and I was going into all this stuff. And I walked back to the table, and this guy from Teach for America said, I agree with everything you said. And I'm saying, like, how could you, you know, how could you? And, and so there's this, I, I don't know what, it, it's, a, it's like a, they, they have appropriated the language of social justice and use it in ways to justify things like denying children access to teachers who are fully prepared. Um, I think, you know, there are some good teachers in Teach for America despite the program. Many of them, including some of my former doctoral students, I mean, have formed an organization called Resistance to Teach for America. One of my doctoral students, Kerry Kretschmar, was one of the uh, founders um, and did her dissertation on TFA alumni. I mean, there are people who really care deeply about equity and justice, and they, they've been, they were deceived, and they had bad experiences. There are others who do okay, and some good teachers, they stay. But overall, I think they're not going to solve the problem of the lack of diversity in the teaching force, of the lack of exp access to experienced teachers, and I think that can be documented, just that we need to... Um, they don't want to engage us. Um, and, and when they do, like at this ARA session with several hundred people, it was like they didn't reveal themselves. I had things that uh, this guy Knowles had written, and that's why I invited him to be in the session. He didn't reveal at all who he was. He was just sort of going, oh, Linda Darling Hammond, you're my idol or something. You know, it was like, why don't you talk about what you say about ed schools and teacher preparation and what where you think we ought to go. And, and so you don't get the kind of debate. But I think that's a, um, an issue uh, we lost in Seattle. I mean, they came to Seattle uh, like they came to Sacramento. And we had a superintendent who was a Broad Fellow. Broad Foundation funds, uh, they train and fund superintendents. And they place people in the central office. And so suddenly Teach for America appears in Seattle and a dean comes into our School of Ed who's an alum for Teach for America, 
and it was later learned that uh, the deal was cut before it even started. You know, we had this sort of illusion of discussion about whether we should do it. Majority of the faculty was opposed, and so suddenly TFA is in Seattle. Um, it has never been very popular, and, and they just kicked it out last year. They're still in Washington State, and my university still runs the program for them. But um, it's people on the school board even admitted there was really no need for them. And so I think there's, uh, it's possible to you know, get out there in a, pub, like a school board meeting um, is the public school system there still public, or has it been taken over as a, um, but Philadelphia is a recovery zone, they call it, just like New Orleans. It's not controlled by, you know, local population. And so Newark, the same. Um, mayoral control and the takeover, you know, dissolve an elected school board, and I mean, that's another part of this. Um, so I think he needs to be confronted by somebody who's going to counter that. Linda Darling Hammond would be good, since she's here. Other, yeah. So when you think about the ways in which we need to better articulate um, the values and the merits of university-based teacher education, are there any particular um, practices or sites within teacher ed programs that you think could yield some promising um, findings, some promising sort of uh, ways of articulating what this practice yields, what teacher education in a, in a good university-based teacher program, what it yields. One of the things that people, some people have been doing, which I think is a good idea, is to be able to show that doing the preparation actually adds value to um, education of kids in the school. So we're not detracting from kids' education by, you know, situating it in a school that it actually enhances it. Uh, things like co-teaching that have become popular. So you have, um, we have a residency program at Heritage University in Eastern Washington that's based on a reservation that they've been able to, they put two or three residents in a classroom and they've really been able to show results in terms of the learning in the schools that have been enhanced. So, you using a term many years ago about uh, the need to open the black box of teacher education pedagogy, that too much of it remains concealed. And I was just wondering if, you know, in 2015, what might be some of those promising black boxes that we might... Well, hear? I think it caught a lot of attention and received a lot of press when Elham and Sheila and others began taking methods courses into the schools. And, and, and sort of working alongside classroom teachers. And, and pe a lot of people came in, including the Gates Foundation, to actually see. So we're, it's visible. We're really dealing with the com realities that we're preparing people to go in. And we're trying to help them learn these research-based practices in those settings. And so we have professors out there in the schools doing the work. Um, I think it's a harder sell to demonstrate the value of social foundations. Um, and so on, but I think it's important. I had one of the uh, students, a graduate, who so I interviewed last, uh, and it was in last year's elementary cohort, told me that the school and society course was the most valuable part of the program for him because it really taught him. He came from out of Seattle and it really sort of educated him about the context he was going into and the history of it and like why these people are living here and how they got there. And, and he, he found that really, really beneficial to being, and he's still teaching in Seattle now. Um, and so I think, um, Arnie Duncan always says, usually in every talk, I spoke to teachers and they hated their preparation. Well, there are a lot, that, the evidence doesn't actually show that, despite what Arthur Levine said. His 63% or 62% that supposedly did not value their preparation, it's been repeated hundreds of times by almost everybody. The 2005 study, there are a lot of other studies that show that actually graduates value their preparation, especially in these new kinds of programs that are more situated and connected and, and so on. And we need to use our own graduates to help us make the case. I, I don't, it's gone so far with regard to our credibility that I don't know if we, we can't do it alone. And the other thing I think is that if we you know, connect with communities, 
And so we're joining efforts in schools and communities to transform public schooling to make it more equitable for everyone's children. And so it's not, we are not, if we do anything by ourselves, I think it's going to be discredited. We're just trying to protect our own interests and so on. So I, that's another reason why I think we need to become part of a larger uh, collaboration and teacher preparation um, and join up struggles that are already going on by public school teachers. And we tend not to do, I've not, I've rarely seen over my career uh, in this country when teachers are fighting, you know, they walk out on strike in Vancouver and British Columbia and the university people are supporting them. They're out there on the picket line. The parents are supporting them and bringing them food. And, and, and so, like, we, we, if we're going to just talk about ed schools in isolation, we're not going to win. Um, and so I think it's, it, that's in terms of how do we do it, I do, we need to do it with others. And we need to convince our school and community partners that what we do you know, that we listen to them and respect them and, and we really do a good job and then we try to make the case together rather than as just university professors. I, I may be, you know, too negative about it, but I really think that when I go to Washington, D.C., it's really depressing. And I was part of a congressional briefing on clinical experiences. They're, I mean, they've written us off. They meaning a lot of policymakers. Yeah. Well, the, the School of Ed piece I talked about a little earlier in terms, I think there, I think there needs to be greater accountability, and I think at, uh, that it can be done in other ways that are more uh, like classroom-based observation over a period of time. That um, I th teachers, I think, from what I've learned in spending almost two years in Alberta, uh, talking with Posse Salberg from Finland, who's a member of the research team doing the Finnish case, and just looking internationally, I think one of the things that struck me is that there is an emphasis in systems like that on teacher learning and development. And there is an accountability. It's more of an internal collegial accountability. It's not like outsiders coming in in a punitive way, assuming that this failure, and we're going to identify it and... Um, you know, get rid of it. And so I think there are ways to deal with accountability that work, um, but are very different from what exists now. So I would, uh, like the performance assessment seems reasonable to expect in a program that people be able to demonstrate performance um, of things that, you know, are agreed to be important for them to learn when they go in. I'm not endorsing the ed TPA or PAC. You know, I, I know their issues. I have them too, and that's why they put me on the national advisory team because Ray Pichon heard that I had been going around complaining about things. And, you know, uh, <laughs> Pearson being involved, I have a lot of issues with that. Um, but the idea of a performance assessment makes sense. Teachers know their content knowledge. But I think we need to invest the resources that we have. Just think if we took all that money that's going to go into value added and put it into strengthening the capacity of schools to host uh, high quality clinical experiences and mentor teachers who actually had that work as part of their job like they do in some other countries. Not like cooperating teachers today who teach full time and then they're expected to do this additional work and some places they might get a, some course credits or a little check to go out to dinner. Um, and, and so it really is not, and so we could get a lot more for our money if we invested in other things. And I don't see anything to improve teaching and teacher ed coming out of those kinds of approaches that exist. In Alberta, while I was doing my study, um, there was a, um, somebody in the government proposed introducing a uh, formal evaluation of teachers every five years. Um, and uh, the result was that the government was gone, left, pre Premier resigned, and, None of that's going to be implemented. The teachers I was interviewing, I had a focal group of teachers that uh, I kept talking to, uh, were outraged at the idea that they needed to send someone in to check and how they were doing. And they, you know, they felt that there was enough uh, responsibility and autonomy, uh, uh, accountability within the school to maintain the quality. 
Um, and so I guess the, my answer, there are different ways to think about accountability. And it's not that there shouldn't be any, but what we're doing now has not demonstrated really that it's improved teaching. Yeah. So if, um, are, are these, these folks who have written off university-based teacher ed, does that mean then that they see the supervised clinical experience as something that's unnecessary? Do you, do, what's going on in the discourse of these groups about supervision, which you know in university-based programs is a key component that we value? So first of all, they make claims that and the Secretary of Education has repeated this, that only you know, less than 50% of university-based teacher education have um, clinical, a supervised student teaching experience. And so I, it's like totally bizarre because of state regulations, but they say it, and it's repeated over and over again because they don't actually know the literature or the leg regulations in the different states. And people just accept it as true, so that's one part of it. If you look at the program, if anybody doesn't have supervised student teaching, it's these early entry programs that have a short something during the summer and then put them in a classroom and they're in charge. It's not the university programs. Um, most university programs have field experiences that start from the time students enter, whether it's graduate or undergraduate, and they go all the way through. Some programs, like Michigan State as an example, have a full year internship that comes at the culmination. The residency programs are mostly school-based along with coursework. And, and so um, and does anybody try to make the case that you know, sort of counter these entrepreneurial models, the sort of corporate approaches or the TFA model that, whoa, you know, where's the field? Where's the experience? People have tried to make the case, but the problem is that the truth doesn't matter oftentimes. Yeah. And that's the point in my Smoke and Mirrors paper, that they, this uh, sort of a, a construction of reality is created, and the truth is often irrelevant. Like, how can Relay make these claims, receive all this money, and when you can't find a single independently conducted study, even showing by their own narrow criteria that they do what they say they're doing? And, and you go around, everybody believes it. And I've tried to confront people about it. I even contacted the research director at Relay, and I said, oh, yeah, am I missing anything? At first, there was uh, nothing. And then my paper came out in TC Records. So now there's something on their website that is essentially capstone projects that they do, where they analyze the growth of their students that they hand in for their master's degree that New York State lets them get, even though they're not a university. Um, any program in the country can put together. I can take capstone projects and make claims about my program, but we need to be able to do more than that. We need to have some independent assessment of, of what, the quality of work it's done, not putting out your own promos. And, and, but they've done that, and they've done that, and everybody believes it because they, uh, there's like a media campaign where articles appear in the Wall Street Journal. Doug Lamov did that one and um, uh, Education Next, and um, the Stanford Social Innovation Review, which I now subscribe to to try to keep track of what's happening. You know, you really need to pay attention to this stuff. But you know, the problem is the truth doesn't matter. And it's not like a, an argument we can sit and discuss this, and somebody could decide you know, who's right. There's an orchestration. Now, this problem I discovered in doing this latest paper there's a general problem, and people have written about it with regard to educational policy, of a gap between research evidence and policy. That it's not just about teacher education. There's a guy, I'm trying to, Lubinsky at Illinois is one of them. Uh, and there's a whole series of Janelle Scott at Berkeley. People who have written about this sort of uh, uh, misrepresentation of the evidence and the, the making of educational policy. And we have the rise of these advocacy groups that put out this, you know, Democrats for Ed Reform had a blueprint for the transformation of uh, teacher education that few people know about called Ticket to Teach. And you can go back in that document and find things that later appear in the Secretary of Education's report and statements by Congress. You know, it's stuff being fed in, a lot of it not based on any knowledge of what actually exists. Like, how could someone claim 
that half the pro more than half the programs don't have supervised student teaching. If you just look, and I did this, I got from uh, our state director of teacher uh, of the Professional Standards Board her password to get into the uh, whatever the group is, all the state policies in teacher ed, and I went through and I listed all the requirements for clinical experiences. There's no way that that statement could be anything close to the truth, yet a lot of people believe it because it's appeared so many times. So it's a, it's a difficult problem about how do you change that. And again, I'll come back, it can't, if we're, it's just professors going out there without being connected to teachers or without being connected to community leaders, we're gonna lose. I mean, I really believe that. And, and so it's not, I think I really believe in the value of this more hybrid approach, but I also think pragmatically and I'm not the only, you know, there have been people like Pauline Lippman in Chicago and Jean Anion, who did a lot of her work in Newark, and uh, this guy at UCLA, um, can't think of his name, who talk about social movements as the key to um, successful reform. Um, and so we need to become, we need to join, we can't operate in isolation particularly from K-12 and teacher unions and so on, we're, we're sort of uh, out there. But even the uh, coalition that AACT put together with every major civil rights group in the United States with both teacher unions, I mean this coalition for teacher quality, I think it's called, they tried to combat the highly qualified teacher deception that I did a Washington Post uh, op-ed on. And even that organization of, of 100 groups NAACP, the Urban League, and so on, could not stop what they did by putting that um, uh, waiver into the general spending bill. So, I, you know, it's um, political hardball. Um, and universities are in a weak position, generally, not just teacher education. Um, in fact, they're going to try to move into universities at large, some of the things they've moved into teacher education. Um, Pretty soon we'll have our ed TPA equivalent for professors. Um, and it's not a joke. Um, and so, um, and that's, it's ironic. I mean, people come here from all over the world because of the quality of our higher education system. And here we are just attacking it and destroying it. 